This is the In Focus podcast from the Hindu. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Hindu's In Focus podcast. I'm Zubeda Hamid, your host for today. COVID-19 may not be raging anymore, but a controversy over the AstraZeneca vaccine known as Covishield in India is. The issue first erupted when AstraZeneca in a submission to a court in the United Kingdom acknowledged that its vaccine could cause a rare potentially life-threatening condition known as thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome or TTS. This led to everything from outrage on social media to political parties issuing statements to a host of misinformation being circulated. What is significant however is that this information about TTS is not new. It was established as early as in 2021 when India's vaccination program was underway and it has been a known fact now for well over 3 years. Just a short time after the court submission made headlines, AstraZeneca also announced the worldwide withdrawal of its vaccine, citing a decline in demand. As of this year, India has administered over 1.5 billion doses of Covishield to its eligible population. What led to the furo over the vaccine's rare side effect and what do we know about it? How robust is India's system to monitor adverse events arising from vaccinations? And what happens to India's vaccination program if Covishield is no longer available? Are there other options available for those who need them or for future immunization programs? We explore these questions and more with Dr. Anurag Agarwal. Dean Biosciences and Health Research at the Trivedi School of Biosciences Ashoka University. Welcome to the Hindus in Focus podcast Dr. Anurag Agarwal. Hi. Pleasure to be here. Doctor, let's begin by unpacking the recent controversies surrounding the AstraZeneca vaccine or Covishield as it is known in India. The very small risk of TTS has been known since 2021, but this still created a massive furore. Tell us about TTS and the actual risk it poses. Certainly. So TTS is a short form for what we call thrombotic with thrombocytopenia syndrome. Very simply it means a type of a situation when people develop large clots at the same time their platelets become low and this is basically a syndrome that has been seen in many things even with drugs like heparin that have been used quite a while. what people die of this can be very very fatal typically is because clots come in very critical regions like the brain and that's how this was picked up so going back to 2021 as the vaccination drive basically starts about 10 15 million vaccine doses have been delivered and in europe they start seeing a very rare type of a syndrome in which there is a thrombosis of a critical think of it like a vein inside the brain leading to death and they normally don't see these cases very frequently and because they have electronic health reporting systems they can see many of these cases are occurring soon after the vaccine so they're able to estimate that possibly a rare side effect at that time estimated to be maybe 2 or 3 in a million is occurring in which severe clotting is occurring and this is tts again it is recognized and they found very interestingly that this was not occurring in severely old people uh, people with any medical problem but typically in relatively healthy young females around 30 years of age and this tended to occur within a couple of weeks within a week to maybe a month from the time of getting the vaccine shot now obviously the minute the risk came out they could figure out that while the vaccine might be beneficial they thought the risk may not be worth it and they stopped the vaccine and this is part of what they submitted in court documents regarding yes their vaccine has been linked to risk of thrombosis and i think while this has been known for multiple years because it came suddenly in a court and people are seeing heart attacks going out around us people keep hearing the word thrombosis they mix the two things together and thought they were hearing something new that to my mind is roughly the background of this particular problem 
Tell us, doctor, every vaccine is obviously administered taking into account uh, the risk versus the benefits. What happened in other countries when it came to AstraZeneca? And what was India's situation like uh, when the vaccine was given emergency use authorization back in 2021? So, you know, when we talk about risk and benefits, there is a third word we must not forget. Risk, benefit and alternatives. So if you calculate the risk, let's take even the worst case scenario. Let's take a young 30-year-old female otherwise healthy. The risk in such a person of dying from COVID is less than 0.1% or let's estimate around 0.1%, just the general population. In elderly people can be as high as half a percent or something. Here, let's make it 0.1%. At 0.1% risk of dying from COVID and a near certainty of getting COVID without a vaccine, you know, the risk benefit is very favorable. On the other side, even in the worst case scenario, you're looking at two in a lakh. Here you're looking at life saved of an order of magnitude higher. So risk benefit is favorable. But now comes the question of alternatives, which is what differentiates different countries. Now in the West, they had a stockpile of mRNA vaccines, which I must add, they had the stockpile because they kept the entire production of the world for themselves. But given whatever it is they did, they had another vaccine that was equally good or better at inducing immunity. It had not been shown to have any fatal side effects. They had been a link to myocarditis, but typically it resolved. And therefore, for them, despite a logical risk benefit being okay for Covishield, or what they would call it, uh, Chadox-1, they decided to switch entirely to mRNA vaccination. And in the beginning, they did it only for the younger people. Later on, as their ability to vaccinate grew and grew, even UK completely switched to mRNA vaccines. Of course, by that time, initial data had also come in which they could see that mRNA vaccines might be even more effective than the DNA vaccines. And the very similar story rolled out in America for the other vaccine, the J&J vaccine. In the J&J vaccine, there was advantage of a single shot providing sufficient immunity. But again, they noticed the same problem, TTS. Again, it was a DNA vaccine. And again, they finally decided to stop it. Now, if we come to India, obviously, mRNA vaccines were unsuitable for India. They required a very strong cold chain storage at very low temperatures that India simply doesn't have. And of course, they were not willing to make it available to India at a sufficiently low price. The other vaccine that India was building was Covaxin. Uh, Covaxin is a vaccine that you would make by growing the virus and then inactivating it. It takes a certain amount of time to build more and more doses. And also, there was some experience from the Chinese Uh, killed virus vaccines, that the immunity might not be as good. So in India, faced with exactly the same numbers, the decision was to continue. Anyway, in our vaccination program, we had not noted any such major effects. And therefore, in India, there was, anyway, when you look at the overall risk-benefit alternative paradigm, it made sense to continue. And many other countries, other than India, also chose to continue with Covishield. You spoke a little earlier, doctor, about one of the reasons this became a huge issue recently is because a lot of people have been noticing or have been uh, saying post-pandemic that there has been an increase in heart attacks, especially among young people. What do we know about this in India? Is there any link at all to COVID-19 or to the fact that you have or have not taken a vaccine? This is a great question that you're asking because this is a topic of huge misinformation. Let's go to the year 2020. Let's talk of the time before vaccines. There are papers from the US clearly showing that after recovering from COVID-19, starting one month after, until the end of the year before the vaccination had even started in America, the risks of heart attack became two, three, four times, depending upon the population. So COVID-19 can directly increase the risk of heart attack, completely independent of vaccines, 
and the more severe the COVID was, the higher the risk of future complications, including heart attacks. In all studies done properly, people who received vaccines have had lower risks of such heart attacks compared to people who did not get vaccines. Now, what happened is that in the beginning, the vaccines prevented infection. But ever since Omicron, the virus has been mutating and evolving so fast that even if you have a vaccine, you get infections. So, which basically means that SARS-CoV-2 keeps on circulating, keeps on creating infection surges, and it is my best estimate that it is repeated infections with SARS-CoV-2 that now we don't even notice because we're not getting the pneumonia, the severe disease, the need for oxygen, that may be driving the increase in heart attacks in the young. That there has been an increase is beyond doubt. If you look at young people, the increase in heart attacks and strokes is at least two to three folds. But if you start dividing into people never vaccinated or vaccinated, and all this data is from America, it's all for mRNA vaccines, you can basically see that, yes, everybody has had an increased risk, but those people who did not get vaccinated and got severe COVID have even greater risk. And I must add one thing to this. As recent as two, three months ago, January, we had another wave of SARS-CoV-2 in the country. I mean, if you look at sewage data coming out of Bangalore, coming out of Pune, where sewage surveillance and sequencing is going on, there was a very nice JN.1 wave. Even right now, I think we are going to see a KP.2 rise in infections. So SARS-CoV-2 is there. I think it is the better explanation for the increase in heart attacks. And vaccines, if anything, are probably protective on the whole. Individuals, it changes, like I explained earlier. Let's talk a little bit about data, Doctor. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the criticisms of India's adverse event reporting system has been that it's not robust enough, that it hasn't recorded all cases of adverse, adverse events arising out of vaccinations. How much data do we have with regard to this? Is this an area that needs strengthening? And in general, does our data itself need strengthening? For instance, even with, re even with regard to the heart attacks or uh, cardiac events that have been seen pre-post-vaccination? Again, a great question. Let me start from your last part. In general, for health, we need strengthening of data. Now, India has been extremely good for data in some ways. So when you look at finance, taxes, many of these things, we have completely digitally transformed. But in health, we are still behind. And you know, it's a matter of priorities. Now, I personally wouldn't even disagree that the huge push in India for using the telecom, IT, finance, these sectors to drive our digital transformation made it economically sustainable where the government didn't have to put in a huge amount of money and private companies shared the load of transforming a billion-plus nation. Now, the challenge is that unless you're digitally transformed or at the very least completely digitalized, where all your data from the very beginning is in digital form and is well collected with quality assurances, you cannot find a side effect that runs to the level of one in a million or one in a lakh because that is not the scale of operation in a given small area for which you might have the complete data. So yes, India runs behind in general for digital transformation of health, more specifically for digital data for health, and even more specifically for collecting data in a natively digital format in a quality assured way as you would require for a nation-scale adverse event system. Now, this is simply, I think, a matter of time. As we push the national digital missions, these things will become better and better. But yeah, this was certainly a weak point for us during the pandemic. And for all of us, we were typically almost always watching for the next release of data and analysis from the UK, which had the, probably the best data in the world. Let's talk about the options, uh, 
Doctor, you talked about the importance when you said risk benefit analysis that we need to look at risks, benefits, and alternatives. Now, COVID shield, as we know, was used for the bulk of the vaccination program in India, alongside, of course, COVID vaccine. What has happened to the Serum Institute of India's Covovax, to Zaidus Kadila's Zycovid, and multiple others? What is going on in this field? Do we need more vaccines to be available? Do we need more data on all of these vaccines to be made publicly available? So I think what happened is that Covovax was a protein subunit vaccine by the Serum Institute. It had very nice results in terms of initial data that came out again from UK. But the challenge was the virus changed. And the Covovax that was made by Serum Institute was still on the ancestral strain, not on Omicron. And by the time the entire system could be set up again, Already a huge wave of Omicron infections had spread across the nation, giving probably most people hybrid immunity, uh, including prior vaccinations plus Omicron infections. In fact, many people also had Delta infections in the past. So the need for a big round of vaccinations, again, for a nation like India, which is mostly younger, uh, most people had already got hybrid immunity with vaccination plus infection with both Delta and Omicron. The cost effectiveness of a f- new national push probably would not have been there. And in absence of support by the government for large public health scaling, the incentive for a company to come up with a new protein subunit vaccine for India also probably would not have been there. Now, I'm not necessarily certain what I'm saying is exactly what everybody thought. But if I put myself in the positions on both sides, I would say it was a natural outcome of the fact that we are a price-sensitive nation. It was a significant amount of expense to completely redo the vaccines. And on the whole, I don't think it made much of a difference. Even if we had come up with new protein subunit vaccines targeted to Omicron, the course of the pandemic within India as a young nation probably would have been about the same. So as you said before, COVID-19 is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. It keeps mutating. It finds vaccine escape properties. Is this going to be a problem going forward? Because as soon as one vaccine is developed, it finds a way to escape that vaccine and therefore it does not make financial sense to keep on developing further and further vaccines, correct? Well, Let's think of it slightly differently. So influenza also changes every year. And we come up with a flu vaccine as an annual shot to a vulnerable population that we believe is at high risk. Now, I think that's the direction we will eventually go with COVID as opposed to a large public health scale vaccination program. It will become a self-catered, targeted vaccination program for those at highest risk. You need to create easy-to-modify vaccines for this. There are lots of new technologies that are coming. There was some talk about a nasal vaccine from Bharat Biotech. Still waiting to see what happens on that one. But by and large, we need to also get rid of the anti-vaccination uh, you know, kind of environment that has started so that people believe that if they invest in making a better vaccine, there will also be a demand. So I think multiple areas for us all to work on, uh, new vaccine technology, maybe a annual type of a vaccination system looking at the latest circulating variant. For example, the US might now be creating a new KP.2 type of a booster. And the target people in America will probably be cancer survivors, people with very severe immune compromise, very elderly people living in nursing homes, but a very, very targeted population. And I think that's the direction this will go. I can't see it going any other way. So AstraZeneca has now announced that it is withdrawing the COVID-19 vaccine worldwide due to a decline in demand. So as you said, uh, does this mean that even India has to go forward in order to target only the vulnerable sections of society for vaccination, like just like you said, an annual shot maybe? And if so, then do we have a large vulnerable population that this will need uh, that, that who will need vaccination so india has to go in the same direction our vulnerable population is small and that's not necessarily a good thing our vulnerable population is small because a the 
lifespan of people with cancer etc tends to be a little bit shorter but of course the majority of it comes from the fact that we are a younger nation so we have less elderly and we of course we have smaller life expectancies as well but these technologies will have to be innovated i have no regret for the phasing out of covishield because now with the dna vaccine platform technology leading to this tts in uh, both examples that we know of and we don't know anything about much about sputnik anyway so it does seem that the platform itself needs improvement also it was not exceptionally cheap and the protein subunit vaccines might be cheaper um, so i think yes india will need to create its own technology in fact we have a amplifying rna vaccine technology is suitable for uh, you know not very high quality cold chains by genova still waiting to see what happens but yes i think the government could do a bit by creating this kind of a vulnerable population vaccination program that is publicly funded giving more belief to innovators that they will find a market otherwise you know third world will always lag behind in these areas and india is at the right point where we are sufficiently technologically advanced sufficiently economically advanced to do this and i am actually 100% certain that what i am saying is already being discussed at higher levels in the government last question doctor so one part of it is of course targeting and therefore and then immunizing the vulnerable population uh what about the other part we talked a little bit earlier about how uh, we do not have the kind of cold chain storage that is required uh, for certain vaccines is that an area also that needs strengthening overall in general yes because today it was vaccine tomorrow it could be something else as a nation having a strong cold chain is certainly a good thing already i can see things are getting better but you know these things require massive infrastructure a cold chain of say minus 20 degrees also requires continuous electricity so it's not a simple problem it's not a health problem it's a nation scale infrastructure problem and as you can already see india's infrastructure is improving step by step by step so i'm optimistic for the future thank you so much for speaking to us today dr agarwal thank you so much In Focus will be back soon with analysis of the biggest news issues. In the meantime, you can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher and other platforms. Just search for In Focus by The Hindu. We'll see you soon.